Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world today. Welcome to today's HFS webinar, where we will be debating why procurement still struggles to deliver the value beyond cost reduction. So let's get started. My name is Saurabh Gupta. I'm the Chief Research Officer at HFS, and I will be your moderator. We have a very large audience today. I know we've got more than 450 registrants and a number of people are trying to dial in and we want to make this engaging. So with that, I wanted to introduce my co-panelists here. I'm pleased to have John Beal, who's the Chief Procurement Officer at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey and Anita carlson Dyan at IBM. Anita and John, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and your organizations a little bit? Sure. John Vealy, Chief Procurement Officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. And just for, for the benefit of those that are, aren't in the United States or not familiar with this industry, Blue Cross Blue Shield is a collection of about 36 separate organizations run independently that manage the health insurance for about 120 million Americans. I have responsibility for New Jersey. So it's an honor to be on the call and I appreciate you inviting me. And this is Anita Carlson Dion. I work for IBM and I'm the leader for our BPO business in North America. A little bit of background I have now, I realized 30 years with IBM, so the time goes fast and I've been in the BPO business with IBM for the past 10 years or so. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, John, for, for joining us. Pretty sure we'll have an interesting debate. So what we'll cover today? I think we want to cover really three things. The first question is why? Why does procurement need a strategic makeover? What is happening in terms of adoption of some of the emerging technologies from the AAA trifecta of automation, analytics, AI, to things like blockchain, et cetera? And what are really the challenges which are faced by procurement executives? I think then we want to deep dive on some of the awesome work that John and his team at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey is doing in terms of transforming procurement to increase not only the ROI, but also focusing on customer experience and basically integrating procurement with the overarching enterprise business strategy. And then last but not the least, we want to talk about the role that third-party procurement service providers like IBM can play in helping clients and CPOs across the world to basically take procurement to a new level and bringing it to the strategic table. So those are really the three things that we'll cover today. But to set the context, I wanted to first talk about the value chain of procurement so we all understand what are we really talking about in uh, in today's webcast and we are talking about the entire source to pay value chain right so we're not just talking about the transactional procure to pay piece of purchase order management invoice creation etc but also the upstream components of strategic sourcing category management contract management etc which is really really what drives procurement strategy and which we think will enable procurement to raise to the next level. There are a number of enabling technologies and a number of operating models and methodologies that are enabling procurement and are enabling procurement's transformation, and we'll touch upon all of them. So moving on, I, I think before we get into procurement, I think it's important to understand the global operations industry. If you look at it, we started the journey of operational transformation started maybe two decades back with the rise of shared services and outsourcing. It then started to evolve into global business services, which were driven by end-to-end -end processes. And we started to see the evolution from just talking about accounts payable to procure to pay and now source to pay. And it's starting to culminate in what, at least at HFS, we call as the one office or the digital one office. And essentially what the one office means is that there is only one office that matters, and that is simply the office that caters to the customer. And as you see through this journey, organizational silos across the front, middle, and back offices are collapsing. And we are starting to see some boundaryless organizations emerging where the one office is starting to become more of a reality than just a pipe dream. And as we've gone through these 20 years of evolution, the value proposition, the value creation levers, the underlying requirements for talent, the role that third parties play, has evolved significantly. And to be honest, I think this journey is still on its way. It's still not complete. But what we fundamentally at HFS believe is 
that some of the emerging technologies, especially the AAA trifecta of automation, AI, and analytics, and also the emergence of uh, things like blockchain and IoT, are helping organizations reach their one office goals uh, much more quickly. If you try and peek into the future, as these organizational silos believe, we we really believe that ecosystems will start to emerge. And these networks will be driven by collaboration across multiple organizations with the common objective to serve the customer, right? Because if we believe that customer experience is really a fundamental driver of value today, then customer experience is not just driven by one organization, right? If I'm buying a car, my experience is not just driven by the car manufacturer. There is an ecosystem of insurers, of the distributors, even the government that really fulfills whether I have a good experience or a bad experience. And I think that's what we call the hyper-connected future state or the hyper-connected enterprise, wherein it's going to be the ecosystems that will really drive customer experience. And if we really believe that the hyper-connected future state is the future state, then which function is better suited than procurement to take us into that uh, role? We believe that the future role of procurement is to become an ecosystem builder beyond just a cost reduction vehicle or beyond being just a back office function. I think the future role of procurement is starting to emerge as the ecosystem builder because they are the function best suited in the organization who know how to structure partnerships, who know how to govern those partnerships, who have a handle on what the market really needs. And I think once you start to see procurement from a different lens than just a cost cutting vehicle, I think that's where the strategic value of procurement will start to come in. So in order to do that, I think it's very clear that the mandate for procurement is is very clear. It's, It's not just cost reduction, right? That's very important, but that no longer ensures success and creating value is equally important. Uh, and to do that, procurement needs speed, innovation, and analytics to make that happen. And, and as you can see, we've done an exhaustive survey of uh, over 400 sort of global 2000 enterprises. And as you can see from these two charts, when you look at the strategy or the strategic goals for supply chain or procurement, I think it's it's a lot to do with improving the speed to market. It's a lot to do with product and service innovation. It's a lot to do with creating new business models. And how you do that is by accelerating your ability to leverage data and analytics. Uh, it's it's improving the business and operational insights. Even if you look at the operational goals, right? It's, uh, it's not just cost reduction. It's about how do you improve customer service quality? It's about how do you streamline customer service delivery models? It's how do you create that one office? How do you improve the back office and middle office efficiencies? I think procurement's digital transformation is about vendor experience or customer experience. It is about one office, but without increasing the costs. And that's really the mandate for procurement as we look forward. So as the overall function procurement, the expectations from the CPO changes, right? I think the expectations from third party services or what we've called procurement outsourcing has also changed. Uh, I think it's a market which is ripe for disruption. Clients definitely expect a lot more. It's it's not just cost reduction. It is still very important as you can see on the left-hand side chart, but there's an emerging focus on value, right? How do you enable the retained organization to focus on strategic and core activities? How do you drive superior business outcomes? How do you drive compliance? Those are really, really important today to win any procurement outsourcing business. There's also a very strong anti-incumbency sentiment. And what it really means is that the service providers or your partners who got you to today's stage might not be the partners for tomorrow. And the sort of traditional wisdom that outsourcing is very sticky and it's hard to change is pretty much out of the window. As you can see on this chart, nearly 70% of uh, the outsourcing clients, and this is a procurement specific chart, are expected to change their outsourcing relationships in some shape or form, either renegotiate for better terms or replace their vendors or even repatriate in-house. So I think there is a strong disruption that's starting to happen. And also the solutions are changing, right? The legacy solutions uh, like offshoring are losing mindshare. Uh, I think for the last 20 years, the only remedy to every problem that you have 
was out, was offshoring, right? If you have a cold or a cough, the answer was offshoring, but that's not the case anymore. We have a number of emerging value creation levers today in terms of these emerging technologies and offshoring is not the only answer. So I think at HFS, we definitely believe that as the role of procurement is changing, the role of procurement outsourcing is also changing and it's ripe for disruption. And last but not the least, the advancements in emerging technologies of the things that we've been discussing, like robotic process automation, machine learning, uh, different elements of AI, blockchain, computer vision, internet of things, is definitely captivating the CPO attention. But in all honesty, the adoption has just scratched the surface, right? As you can see on this chart, there are very, very few scaled and industrialized uh, adoption patterns that we've seen across these technologies. In fact, in our recent survey where we, where we surveyed nearly 600 business leaders, almost everyone or a majority of procurement executives wanted to scale up and industrialize their intelligent automation initiatives within the next two years. But the problem is how do you get to that promised land, right? There's only five to 7% that have scaled up some sort of uh, automation or AI initiatives. Almost everyone is looking at it from a piecemeal basis. The suppliers are going to the market on a piecemeal basis. The whole angle of integrated automation is missing. And also only 5% have an enterprise-wide approach to using IA within, uh, within sourcing or procurement. Long story short, I think there is a realization that procurement is not just a back office cost cutting vehicle, but procurement has a much more strategic role in the business. We believe that role is to become the ecosystem builder for the organization. Uh, we also, so the why is pretty clear. I think the what is also emerging. It has to do something with these emerging technologies, right? From the AAA trifecta to blockchain to other emerging technologies. But the real question is how? How do you get to that promised land? And that is the reason why we invited John and Anita to talk about their experience at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield and talk a little bit about how did they sort of go about this procurement transformation. So John, maybe I should bring you into this conversation and ask you, describe to us a little bit about the procurement challenges at BCBS. What were you facing when you joined and uh, what was really the driver behind procurement transformation at your organization? Sure, I'd be happy to kind of give you a, a quick overview. So when I joined approximately five years ago, this, the organization was primarily a back office function that was performing a kind of a papering function for the organization, making certain that kind of basic needs were being dealt with. However, most of the contracts and, and negotiations were being dealt with at the business uh, business division level. The organization at that time was uh, had gone through a fairly significant reorg, reorg and uh, the, the firm that was brought in to kind of help assess, you know, how to re, kind of redesign the organization came in and said there was a great big opportunity in terms of the cost side of your business. You really need to uh, up your game as it pertains to, um, you know, how you source and how you procure products and services. It's the number one cost uh, besides people within your organization, and you're really not managing it that well. And so... Uh, the organization agreed to that and went on a search, and I was lucky enough to be the person that they selected to kind of come in and start that transformation. And and I went to my first meeting with the with the CEO and his and his uh, and his staff, and the first thing I was told is, we expect to hear breaking glass on a regular uh, on a regular basis. We can't continue to do things the way we're doing them and and expect great results. And so we expect friction. We want that friction to be positive, um, but but we expect our friction. And so, um, you know, I laid out, and you know, in the, you know, the typical first hundred days, I laid out a kind of a people process and technology plan. I got the funding for it, um, and we were off to the races. Um, uh, you know, fairly significant increase in the size of the team, uh, fairly significant increase in the skill set of the team, um, and we um, and we were able to bring in. Uh, actually, able to leverage some of the technology that had been acquired right before I had gotten. So um, it was. Uh, it was no, that was very interesting, John. So, do you, sure. as you mentioned, you you had some 
people process and technology initiatives can you describe a little bit about the key initiatives across these three areas that you that you undertook in your first 100 days of breaking the class <laughs> sure so um so i'll start with people because obviously i think they're they're, uh, they're the key here um, um effectively what we had was really two halves of our organization uh, one was people that supported IT and then the other group was the people that supported everything else. Um, and, uh, and, and that wasn't really working effectively because the people in IT were expected to, uh, you know, negotiate uh, offshore application development services one day and then, you know, run an RFP for laptops the next day kind of thing. And so, so just using IT as an example, what we did is we kind of specialized uh, the labor force, right? We we brought in some new people that that specialized in services. We brought people in that specialized in uh, hard hardware. People that specialized in software, and we kind of and we um, and we effectively built a ticketing system, um, leveraging the tools that were there, so that uh, when people entered a request for work, when they selected a particular category of sourcing need that they had, that the, that the tickets and the requests were 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 sorted such that they went to the people that had the specific uh, knowledge base. And, and in doing that, a couple of important things took place, I think. Um, the, the business divisions who were now interfacing with the new sourcing people began to realize that, that, that the people from sourcing weren't there simply to run a process, but were there uh, with, with industry knowledge and some subject matter expertise, and they began to become uh, much more integrated. We also uh, took a page out of the uh, out of the journalism book by basically embedding uh, the sourcing organizations of people into the into the divisions that they supported, um, and and that really um, re really got us the kind of traction that we needed to build some momentum, uh, so that we so that we can kind of engage in the higher level or higher order type of negotiations that really make up a, a big chunk of, of Blue Cross's or any Blue Cross or any health insurance industries. Uh, Business, which is to say, um, really getting into uh, some of the, uh, the uh, direct side relationships, right? Uh, our relationships with our pharmaceutical providers, our relationships with our lab services providers. These are where the real money is being spent in, in health insurance. I don't know if that that if that uh, helps. Yeah, I know that's further. that's that's very helpful. So I think essentially you started to change the talent profile by hiring more specialized folks and that started to change the culture within the organization as it started to get embedded within the uh, uh, within the business and they started to leverage procurement more as a as a partner versus one of those back office functions where they basically wanted you to uh, process yeah, the purchase yeah. orders. Uh, so that's that's very helpful. Uh, what were sort of the technologies uh, or emerging technologies? You mentioned ticketing system, uh, but but did you start to leverage anything beyond that as well? Uh, sure, I, I would say um, at, the, at the beginning there was so much opportunity, um, just in, in, in terms of kind of the in, in the first couple of years, the, the, the you know just simply building a ticketing system, having a way to track tickets and, and give people the, the ability to self-service themselves to find out where their tickets were, right? Where, you know, that was another big, big challenge that, that I had identified when I came in. It was simply that people would contact sourcing, ask them to do something, and then, and then lo and behold, they, you know, a month would go by and they had no idea what was going on. And that kind of angered people. So, like I said at the beginning, I, I think it was really a matter of, you know, the, the building the people and the relationships was, to me, the most critical function when I started. Um, you know, some of the things that, that we, I think we want to talk about here were things that started probably at two and a half to three years after um, I came on board when we began to realize that um, that the you know the, the embedding and the you know the development of, of stronger policy and policy compliance rules and tracking of these kind of things um, what would be what we began to see uh, was that there was a lot more work that we had no idea what was, what was going on. And so at about the same time, our, our industry is, is, you know, with a lot going on with the federal government and so forth and so on, hiring was a, was a challenge. And so that's when, when the hiring became a challenge, um, 
uh, that's when we really started to focus more on the technology side of, of sourcing because we realized that unless we were able to leverage technology in, in a, in as a means to uh, to speed up the benefit that we were able to deliver um, and to effectively you know, offload quite a bit of the kind of the redundant tra transactional type of stuff that we did, unless we were able to leverage technology to do that, then we would have very quickly began to slip back into where things were before I got there, which was it takes too long to get things done and I submit things and I don't know where they go. Kind of thing. And you would begin to have challenges with maintaining bright people uh, willing to kind of commit to long-term tenure at at, uh, at Horizon. Got it. Hey, uh, John, before we move on to the next question, there's an interesting question on uh, uh, from one of the audience members. Um, and the question is, did you make an effort to make your procurement reps understand the business that they're supporting? Because according to this gentleman, this is one of the gaps that he almost always sees in procurement transformations where CPOs appoint procurement folks, but they don't know what's the business that they're supporting. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very uh, well taken point. Um, yeah, one of the, so just a little bit of background. So I've been working with the blues in various different forms and functions for a long time. So when I talk a, a little bit about bringing in new, new folks and new uh, people, one of the things I did from a recruiting uh, perspective was I, I, I sought people that had insurance-based background. Uh, I, you know, that, that made the, the recruiting process a little bit longer, um, but b to be quite frank, I felt exactly the way your, 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 the person who submitted the question felt is that not understanding the industry that you're working in is and can be a significant disadvantage. So I was, you know, I had quite a tale. I'd worked, again, for a number of years within the Blues. I had made a number of relationships, and so a number of the people that I used to work with uh, were willing to come and uh, come to New Jersey, so I was very lucky in, in that sense. But um, if if the people within a sourcing organization don't understand the industry they're supporting, that's a gigantic gap and, and one that should be uh, sh should be filled very quickly because uh, it'll only serve to kind of drive a wedge between the, the sourcing organization and the business. Got it. So yeah, procurement is not just a horizontal function. It's very important to basically make right. it industry specific and contextual to your own organization. Okay. So so tell us a little bit about the impact so far, um, uh, John. What's what's been uh, after all your initiatives? What are the kind of classes that you've broken, and uh, <laughs> where, and where do you go from here? What's the sort of future roadmap? Well, sure. Um, that's a big question. But so uh, I, I would say, you know, some of the things that um, that we're able to do that I think were kind of uh, significant, right? Because we were able to effectively um, identify and consolidate all of these shadow sourcing organizations that many, many organizations with the people on this call probably deal with on a daily basis. Again, I, I you know, it, it's, it's a little bit easier for me, right? Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, New Jersey is a $14 billion company, but it's primarily one state in, in five buildings, right? It's not, it's not 50, 50 countries in, in 500 buildings kind of thing. And so, so it's a little easier to manage this, but, but effectively what we're able to do is by building credibility in the early stages, I was, and by bringing in the right people with the right skills, I was able to go to the CIO uh, in particular and say, listen, you gotta get rid of this shadow organization. It's inefficient and it's just causing friction and, and, and problems. Um, so, uh, so key number one was kind of getting the sourcing organization centralized, and in becoming the, the you know the the organization that the entire business went went to for its sourcing and procurement needs. That that was a that was a pretty big win. Um, once you know when I first came on board, I, I think against the, the total uh, adjustable spend of about um, at that time about six hundred million dollars, uh, the organization had. Uh, delivered something in the vicinity of less than one percent value in return. That value is cost savings and cost uh, and cost avoidance combined. Um, that wasn't getting the job done. So, so um, what we've been able to do is in this in the current year, we're in the last several years, we've been able to deliver 
uh, about 5% broken down evenly between savings and avoidance uh, against what is now a, a book of business that, uh, that we manage of about 4.5 billion. Once we were able to kind of prove as an organization that we can handle uh, the indirect spend, we were asked to start to get engaged in the, on the direct side, which I mentioned earlier is really where the money is being spent in most health insurance companies. And so, um, so we've been able to um, to effectively in, engage and leverage our relationships to 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 open up vast new areas of opportunity, and we've continued to be able to to deliver. Um, in 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 2017. Um, when I began to see, you know, our cycle times beginning to increase, and I and I started to see our compliance rating kind of dropping below 90, I began to become uh, a little concerned. And so I, I raised the issue with my with my management, and they said, you know, find a way, but it's not going to include many more people, kind of thing. And so I said, all right. And so I uh, I uh, I was uh, on a on a trip. I had a planned trip. To meet with uh, a number of outsourcing organizations, I spent probably three or four months meeting with various different groups. Um, and my my effective challenge was: listen, I I need, and I'm very interested in bringing in both uh, uh, technology as well as resources that can uh, deliver incremental value, uh, but at no incremental cost to the firm. And um, and I found a lot of companies willing to take that leap, right? They, they, their view being that they could certainly, um, um, you know, they, they, they would look at, you know, at a health insurance company in the United States and say, there's got to be plenty of opportunity in there. And so they're willing to make a leap. Um, and and so I, it, was a, it was a difficult choice, right? We went through a fairly uh, significant sourcing initiative and we ultimately picked, um, IBM, who's in, in Anita, who's here in the room with me, for a variety of, of reasons, um, um, not the least of which was that uh, we were a major uh, uh, client to to IBM. IBM has been a great supplier to Horizon, but but the real the real key was the team that they put in front of us was much more. Um, I would say much more service oriented than I had ever dealt with in, in, in previous uh, inter interactions with IBM. There was a whole different kind of world view, right? They, 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 they um, were very willing to uh, commit time, energy, and resources to understand our business, which is going back to the initial question is you can't be good at something unless you know what the environment that you're working in. They, they took a long time to understand my, our, my business, my industry, and the challenges that I face and we're able, we're able to put together um, kind of a, a, a proposal that really kind of hit all the, the key marks that I talked about earlier, which was you're going to you're going to you're going to offload some of the transactional kind of stuff that, that quite frankly we spend 80% of our 60% of our time doing that's generating limited uh, or no value. Um, you're going to introduce technology that's going to uh, whether through RPA or machine learning, that's going to that's going to simplify and streamline the processes that we that we have to manage. Um, you're going to introduce analytics that is going to let me mine for opportunities that, quite frankly, I walk by in the halls on a daily basis and never have any knowledge that I'm walking by them. Kind of thing. <laughs> and, and and you're going to do that in a way that 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 is you know, where where my fees are less than my uh, are are less than the, the than the value that's going to be generated by by this engagement, and um, no, that's great, John. I think okay. we've got a we've got a number of uh, questions um, for you, but I wanted to bring Anita into the conversation before we get to the questions. Uh, so, Anita, John talked about uh, actually he talked about the AAA trifecta. He talked about RPA. He talked about analytics. He talked about machine learning or AI. Tell us a little bit about what is IBM doing to support. Uh, John and his team uh, uh, beyond the beyond the usual sort of procurement outsourcing uh, services. Yeah, thank you, Saurabh. So uh, as everybody heard here, when John came in and did a lot of work himself with the team uh, in the first two and a half years. So when we uh, had the opportunity to engage with John, he was already running a quite very good shop. 
right? And this was to do that incremental, the next generation, we call it procurement 2.0, and bring that to, uh, to John and the team. And uh, focused around uh, analytics, um, robotics, uh, the digital workforce, of course, and uh, other technologies. And you know, it's it's there's no magic in any of this, right? It's yeah. just hard work, attention to detail, and partnering around identifying how we, IBM, could add the most value to John as fast as possible, because there were as everybody had the constraints around you cannot invest more. We got to do it within the middle that that we currently have. So so we were you know sitting together and and co-creating, collaborating, and co-creating around how we can take advantage of everything that John had put in place already, and then what we, IBM, could quickly take over or automate um, the digital, we call it digital worker, right? Uh, so we could free up time so John's team and, and the category and, and the sourcing team could spend more of their time on the strategy, on being closer to the business, um, and, be, and provide more recommendations into the business around and the sourcing and the purchases, et cetera. And it's touching on what you call, Sora, the one office, um, and what we, we choose to call middle office over here is to connecting um, the, the two sides of the process, right? And which you already articulated, Sora, but I'd just like to come back to that point, um, that, you know, as we look at outsourcing going forward, it's it's not about you know running in your silos. It's how do you bring the whole ecosystem of the uh, source to pay really to life and and digitize the middle so you can learn from the beginnings of the process, knows what's happening at the end of the process. You have a constant feedback loop so you can make the right decisions up front. Because I think we all know that if the sourcing and and the the decisions and the coding and the PO all of that is done correctly or or with, with a lot of integrity. The, the follow-on process to, for that transaction to go through is going to be touchless. And I think that's where we all want to come to at the end of the game around an account payable situation where, where we're paying on time without any manual intervention because the data is correct when we get to that point. And, and that is, a lot of that lies in procurement in addition to, of course, finding what are the areas, how can we optimize the, the sourcing and lower cost of operation by, by um, improving the, the purchasing overall. So it's it's nothing, you know, it, it is the normal blocking and tackling, but it is around technologies and primarily automation, um, but we're also bringing in the analytical capabilities and also did with the digitization that's required to go, um, to pull out the information from the data that, that is possible uh, to do. Yeah, no, that's very that's very helpful, um, Anita. And thanks for plugging in the one office, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> You're as, welcome. as 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 I was also talking about Anita, that uh, at least at least we at HFS believe that uh, the whole procurement BPO space is is pretty ripe for disruption. Uh, I, I don't think the legacy solutions are the solutions that will take us into the future. So the first question is. Do you agree with with that? And then, if yes, then what are you doing at IBM uh, to sort of cater to this changing nature of demand? Yeah, thank you for that, Saurabh. So, so yes, um, it's changing, and it's changing everywhere really fast, right? So, it, the the key is to try to keep on top of that. And what we're showing here are some of the or well, our key items around um, what we look at procurement. I said procurement two dot all here. What are the key attributes or, or capabilities that, we, that we're working to create together with our clients? And we talked a lot about the experience uh, for the employees in the organization, for the buyers, for the procurement team themselves, and of course for the vendors. And may I just add here one point, this will be a detour, Sora, but what we also see interestingly enough is that the account payable function is more often being pulled into the uh, responsibility of the CPO. We have done that change within IBM, for example, right? To really, again, <laughs> connect the dots through that S2P uh, process, which I think is helping um, overall to make uh, smarter decisions and drive more efficiencies uh, going forward, to have one owner end-to-end uh, -end and no you know, finger pointing between the two different organizations. So anyway, uh, first one is clearly around the, the procurement stakeholder experience 
regardless of who the stake, stakeholder is. That, that also means more self-service, like the ticketing system that yeah. uh, John brought up. That's a key foundation for a, a, a what we will call here intelligent workflow, right? That the, there's a way to move the transaction forward and also in that process automate and digitize as much as possible so there's no less exceptions and less need for people to handle. The other one is then um, providing more time for the uh, more capacity for the ca category managers, which all, which is all around um, centralizing the buyer um, desk and sourcing centers. And so that might not be much technology on the surface, but you've got to have the underlying technology to go make it happen, to have seamless communication across teams and, and have the data surface on dashboards and, and the workflow is moving the, the, the item along uh, versus sitting still and waiting for somebody, someone to do it. Um, what we're also seeing is that we're now applying analytics um, and, and, of course, cognitive aspects of that, right, to identify opportunities. Not just, we talk a lot about cost savings, but it's also on the cash, on the working capital side. I mean, paid on time and, and what that confidence it gives the, the, the company to go to a, a vendor and say, hey, I know I'm going to pay on time. Um, I, you have a discount agreement, and if I paid a week earlier to what, what discounting, and I'd like to take advantage of that, for example. So analytics um, is uh, which capabilities that we have, which we're um, including in, in the in the processes. And then more, you know, hands-free automated ordering, using more catalogs, online contracts, and, and easier electronic supplier enablement. And we're we're partnering with the, in the ecosystem, the whole source to pay. Um, the universe is very much an ecosystem of different companies, and, and here at IBM we take pride in the around the analy analytical side and, and the cognitive um, process going forward. But we're also partnering with others in the industry that have created um, niche or, or certain capabilities. So a company doesn't have to reinvest or say, "Hey, I invested in this." Now IBM comes with something different. We'd like to build upon what the company has, just like yeah. we have done with John. Could I, I just want to sneak in a, a comment that, to, to add on to uh, what Anita said, which was that part about, you know, uh, humans tend to want to do, uh, me and, you know, I, probably everybody included, but we tend to want to do the things that are easiest first, right? And so when, when, you, when, when I first got on board and even during the first year or two, you would look at the kind of the, 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 the tickets or the things that were assigned to individuals at, at the various different levels within the organization. And, and you would inevitably be, you know, you see 20 different initiatives, right? And, and, and you would ask what people are working on and then inevitably be working on the simplest things, right? Because I think um, may, maybe I shouldn't assign, assign this problem to everybody, but, but I think people want to have a list and they want to cross things off the list. And, and, so, and so what was happening were our people were really spending a ton of time working on the things to get that delivered the least amount of value that impressed the client with the least amount simply to cross things off the list and and the double edged sword to that is, is that then they were leaving themselves less time to actually work on the things that were really strategic and really added value and made them more sticky to their client and so when when we engaged with IBM and we created this kind of more buyer function and and we and we we introduced the logic in the ticketing system that would route uh, requests to the right group um, what what that quickly did um, for better or for worse was it identified those people within the organization that really didn't know how to do strategic sourcing very effectively, and and they struggled, and they, and they and they and they just couldn't they 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 couldn't focus on it that there were too many there were too many intricacies to the work or they didn't understand how one part of the company affected the other part of the company or whatever the case may be, and so it created some it created a little bit of kind of uh, flux in the, in the in the system for a while. We did a couple of things, right? We moved people into roles that where they where they, where they would excel and where they felt more comfortable. Um, some people were were worked out of the organization because it, it just wasn't working, or we retrained people and we and we gave them the skill set and the, and the support they needed in order to feel comfortable to work on some of these more strategic projects. Remember, when I came on board, the, the large part of the team was already there, and they, you know, and and my, I'm not the kind of person that's just okay. The first thing we're going to do is fire everybody and hire everybody now. Because they had a lot of embedded knowledge, they had a lot, a, a lot of background, and, and and it was really important to me to to try not to to you know to try to leverage all of that. So, so the you know there's been a couple of questions that have cropped up. 
I can I can tell you that you know when I got on board, I, I said we were saving less than or achieving less than one percent in value. Today we achieved six percent in value. Our target that was set by the board was around three to four percent in value. So we're exceeding goals. Our compliance is above ninety percent, which is very important. Our diversity spend is up three times what it was because we focused on the fact that we needed diversity within our supply base. So all of the things that the company asked us to do, we're doing. And one of the keys to all of this, guys, and I and I can't emphasize this more, is that you know you can toil away in ambiguity your whole life, and, and, and I was, and I've done it for a number of years. But the minute that we started to engage with some of these tools that that, that we're now using, you know, Cognos and, and and the Watson capabilities, we began to be able to build dashboards and visuals that that allowed the company to see what the sourcing organization was doing. And we and, and I'll tell you, don't use all your real estate to talk about how much money you're saving because, quite frankly, that's a slippery slope. What we began to start showing is how we're mitigating risk and how we're reducing cycle times and how we're partnering with our clients, things of that nature. And, and by doing that, it actually opened up uh, interest in, hey, can you go out and build us a, a better supplier management function, right? We have them all over the company. I want to consolidate. I think you guys can do it. And the only reason they said that to us was because they liked the dashboards, they liked the visualization, and they liked the data and how it was presented. Doesn't mean I'm any better than the people that were doing it, but the fact is I was able to present the data in a way that executives understood it, made a world of difference. And and, and we're working on that. We, we, we brought in you know, a, a really good outside firm to help us to kind of build a supplier management function, and we're, we're on the verge of rolling that out. So um, then you start to, you know, you really begin to get a handle on the entire life yeah. cycle of a supplier relationship when you start doing the governance and supplier management post-contracting. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of value in no, uh, so Anita and John, those were those were really excellent points. Um, and, and there have been some questions around. Could you please share some more quantifiable uh, sort of impact metrics and key success factors? And you started to do that um, yeah. uh, from a from a BCBS perspective. Uh, but Anita would yeah. also be helpful to learn from IBM, given you've got so many uh, clients. What's what's been some of the some of the impact um, that uh, uh, that uh, these change agents have uh, have brought to the table. Yeah, thank you, Samrab. And and you can see here some of the key, key metrics. So compliance, as we know, we live and die by that. That's that's at the end of the day, we can have the best strategies in the world, or have catalogs forever. <laughs> but if no one is using them or following direction, it, we we won't get the savings yeah. that we worked so hard to achieve. So. We we do see with our with with our capabilities uh, to drive up to over and like John said over 90% compliance and and beyond the ROI around the investment spent with with, uh, with us uh, is about 12 times um, for for this investment and um, we are increasing productivity and 40% increases and we believe the, the industry average sits about 22% and then savings right 10 to 20% savings improvement. Uh, which translates in, from a profit perspective as if you grow revenue by 24%. So we have some very uh, tangible, and, and I think uh, we're very proud to say that, just like John articulated here, that the clients um, that we work with, they see this kind of improvement in, in their operation and uh, is very, very excited about then what's next, which I think, Sarah, back to your point about the, the one office and the disruption, we all know we, we always need to continue to move on. We, we're never going to be good enough, right? Like John, fantastic job, two yeah. and a half years, realized, hey, I got to do more. Yeah. And and I, I'm curious on that point, if, if I may sort of ask John a question here, um, how you how you got your team excited about another round of change? <laughs> well, the change never stops, so it never says that, yeah. that there was another round. But um, I, I said to the uh, to the folks on, on my team and um, that, you know, this is probably not going to be the last place you'll ever work and you'll probably want to move and and, 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 and expand your career. And, and, and so by, by working in an environment that is adopting the latest and greatest in technologies, um, then it just builds your resume, right? And it's, it doesn't, it may sound a little uh, the opposite of self-serving kind of thing, but, but quite frankly, um, it, um, 
the turnover rate within our group is really small, and I think part of it is because of the simple fact that they're engaged in things that they never thought they would be engaged in before, um, and they're and they're um, you know again it's much smaller. You know, I, I I know you know if anybody's on this call that's working for you know a multinational conglomerate that you have a bunch of different challenges than I have, but 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 at the at the micro level, you know, opening up opportunities with these new technologies and bringing in people that kind of have a, a flair for this kind of stuff or rewarding people that are a flair for this kind of stuff it has made a world of difference. Uh, it really has. And, and um, so the change kind of thing is I've, I've kind of made it into, you know, if we're not changing, then we're not, then we're not having fun kind of thing. And so so the, it, it seems to have worked at least for now. I right. see what happens. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was great. So I think you've you've already started to share a lot of learnings and best practices. But if I could ask both of you to share just one, uh, what what is people who are listening in to to both of you today? What is the one thing that they should do uh, tomorrow or when they go to work next uh, that that really makes for uh, for this change to become real? What would be your advice? Uh, and maybe John, I'll start with you. Okay, sure. Uh, um, there's a there's a number of things. I I would say you know assuming most of the folks that are on the call are you know are, are in the sourcing and procurement space, um, I would say that taking the mindset that savings and cost avoidance are not the things you should be striving for, but that those are the things that will come if you're doing good work in, in, in this space and you're, and, you're, and you're creating great opportunities for people, you're, 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 you're doing the work necessary in order to get your company to invest in the technology. The, the savings and those kind of things kind of fall at the bottom of that kind of thing. It, 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 it has to go in terms of objectives and things of that nature, even when you're setting goals for people within the organization, don't don't make savings the number one ob objective because I think by doing so, um, it just kind of limits the um, limit the view of what people think that they can accomplish within a sourcing and procurement organization. They, it, it, you know, they measure themselves on it and they compare themselves on it and they compete against it, which are all can be considered good things, but in, in but the reality of it is, if it's only savings, that get, that should get smaller and smaller every year. And if you're not doing things to uh, you know, speed the process, to uh, mitigate risk, to to partner with suppliers, to look for for opportunities to generate revenue, then then your sourcing team is missing the the biggest part of what the future is supposed to look like. And, and, and again, in my opinion, oh, that's a great advice. Not talking about savings. <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah, my point of view here would be a little bit around uh, being bold and, um, like John has done, be at the table as a business partner, not as a back office function. And another th third part of that is, which we haven't really talked about much, is uh, the quality of the data, and, which leads to the digitization, which leads to the ability to do anything, to have dashboards. Yeah. If you have good data, you can have actionable dashboards and you where, where you then get in front of you they, that means i need to take an action right so so it is important i i from my first point of view that you take ownership of the data and put in the time and uh, needed to make sure that the, the data that you that, that's flowing through the, the process is um top-notch accurate clean up and don't and uh, don't allow things to need to be cleaned up later in the process because it's just just super inefficient and, and that's uh, i think sometimes something that we might take for granted or the other way we think it's too hard so we're not going to focus on it and um, but in the as i look into the future with the capabilities that we have around analytics and cognitive capabilities and just the whole automation as well if the data is right you can the the sky's the limit on how you can improve and make your process more efficient, but how much value you can clean out of your data and, and make different decisions that will benefit your business. 
No, I think I think Anita, that's a that's a fantastic point. I think we all keep talking about data lakes and whatnot, but in reality, almost all organizations that I've worked with are living in data swamps, uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I think we need to good quality data is the is the start of any any transformation. So so look, that's uh, that's great. I think we should move to there are a number of questions that we've not answered, and we should. Uh, we should try and cover as many as we can uh, over the next uh, five minutes or so. But I just wanted to share with, uh, with the audience that we've today we've just released our uh, top 10 uh, research uh, research report on uh, procurement, uh, which evaluates uh, 12 different service providers and what they are doing in terms of uh, changing the procurement outsourcing landscape. So if, if and when you get time, please do look at it. Also, one of the uh, questions that's been uh, that's that's been very common is, uh, will you get this deck? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will post the recording of uh, of this webinar on our website uh, in a couple of days, so so you can absolutely access this. Um, so let me ask a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, for you, Anita. Is is your IBM procurement offering suitable for small and medium companies uh, for it to be a good investment? Uh, what should be the size of company in terms of revenue? So I won't answer that question with a number because I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, I think John and the Horizon is a good example of a yeah. smaller organization yeah. Yeah. where we have come in and the team that we have, the IBM team is, is quite small. Right, and still able to generate this type of benefits, and and I think upsk not upskilling, but allowing your team to do much more higher value work. Yeah. Um. So absolutely yes to small and medium business. It's not the mom and pop store, right? Yeah. Um. But uh, and these they also the beauty here is that as we're building these capabilities, it's a little bit plug and play. You don't need to buy it all. You don't don't have to be this humongously big procurement re reimagining things. It's let me come in with this capability around sourcing analytics, the catalog solution, a, a ticketing system. Those type of point products can help you so you don't have to bite it all off and invest a lot of money up front. But it's a journey and a phase journey that we uh, absolutely can partner on to, to make it the rate and pace that fits for you, uh, aligned with the funding that you have and the value that you need to get out of it. And again, the beauty is that we can take over a lot of work and probably do that much lower cost. Uh, for a lot of companies across the whole spectrum source to pay, and which will free up money up front to invest or reinvest into technology, et cetera. Got it. No, that was helpful. So the next one, um, uh, potentially, John, you may want to uh, try and answer this, is uh, you mentioned that you have embedded your procurement folks uh, into the business, uh, but at the same time, you've also hired sort of category specialists, like for hardware, software, et cetera. How do you marry these two things, right? And and the person who's asked this question also gives an example of, let's say a business unit wants a large SaaS deal or something, but your representative for that business unit is not really an expert in SaaS. So how do you marry these two sort of requirements of embedding people in the business, but also having uh, category expertise? Yeah. So, um, so the, so you can, um, many organizations try to do one or, one or two things, right? They try to align along, you know, the sorts of people on the business line, or they try to align along the, category, the spend category line, right? So what I've, what I've described is we've aligned on the spend category. And so, for instance, um, if somebody was going to do, in this particular case, a large SaaS deal, um, more often than not, those last those large SaaS deals are they're going to have a, a fairly significant IT component to them. Um, and, um, and so, um, I'm only speaking about my, my industry, and you guys might have different industries, but, but for me, when, when a large SAS deal comes in and inevitably ends up in IT, and, and there's an IT person within embedded within the, the IT organization that special. There's actually two people that specialize in in SAS deals. But what I've seen in, in larger organizations um, um, is that you have you know you have specialists 
embedded in, in the spend categories that they support in the wherever the primary buyer is, right? And then, but you also, at a secondary level, you, you assign kind of what you would call a liaison um, uh, to that to that business. So, for instance, uh, a, a, a manager that supports uh, IT services uh, is the liaison to to the IT organization. Um, and what and what that translates into is if, if the if our services organization needs to do a, a large um, the SAS agreement, they would talk to their embedded person, and that embedded person would say, I'm not the person that's going to help you with this. Let me connect to you and bring in the, the specialist on our team that's over in IT. And, they, and you know, again, it's a much different world that I think I live in, and it may be a lot easier by virtue of the fact that we, you know, a lot of these people are all in, you know, one complex, right? It's not, again, it's not spread across the world. But um, I don't know if yeah. I did a good job at answering it. That, but, uh, no, you did. It's a, it's a complicated yeah, answer I, and a complicated yeah, yeah. question. I don't think there's a there's a right or wrong uh, uh, yeah. wrong answer. I think the answer lies in how do you how are you able to better collaborate internally within procurement to serve the needs while yeah. providing expertise. Uh, but that was helpful, uh, John. I think uh, we'll take one one more question uh, and then we'll wrap up. And this is an interesting question, and maybe uh, both of you can take a shot at this. Is what is what is the one new age AI or intelligence tool, technology, solution that we can expect in the S2P domain that you're really excited about? Um, if there is I think the, yeah, yeah. That, there might not be just yeah. one. It's a combination of things, I believe. And it all, from my perspective, uh, anchors in that, um, in the analytics and, and the ability to, to have a machine, you know, a machine learning robot that will learn and then know what what to what to do with the exceptions. Um, so I I would I, I might pass on that big one thing, but rather what we're working on at IBM is to create a a platform to bring together AI analytics, machine learning, and robotics into the workflow a, across the board, and which would for example, you know, um, starting with the digitization up front, reading everything um, digital to extract all the information needed. And that's, as we know, is a nightmare, whether we like it or not. But the technology is really catching up there to be able to do that quick and with good accuracy. And then moving the, the transaction or the PO, the PR or the invoice through uh, the process appropriately. So I'm, I'm not I'm not really in the sourcing space here. Yeah. So maybe John, you yeah. can comment in sourcing, but yeah. in the rest of the process, it is about the the AI, the digital worker, and and making that cognitive, so that it's going to be a human touchless transaction at the end of the day. Yeah, maybe I can end with a really. I think this is a really interesting um, uh, example of a little bit of what I need to just mention, right? So. Digitization, right? So we spent a lot of time, you know, loading all of our information uh, into the into IBM's Watson platform. And, and I'm, you know, I don't want. And there are other there are other platforms out there that can do some of the things, but our, our, in our case, it's Watson. And I'm going to give you one little example of something that happened that that quite frankly um, resonated universally within our organization. It sounds very simple. And it is, but it was impossible uh, to, to see. Again, when I talked earlier about walking by opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so one of the things that all of us deal with, uh, as an example, is you know building maintenance and building facilities maintenance. Uh, and, and one of the things that we had done was we had signed an agreement with the supplier, and part of that agreement basically said that we'll pay for all of the cleaning supplies that 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 is involved in this cleaning, you know, in this contract. You can say oh, that's a pretty simple, basic contract, right? No, no big deal. Well, what 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 we do with IBM is on a monthly basis we have what are called insights, where they look at the data and they identify areas of opportunity, and then we dig into them a little bit. Well, one of the insights that uh, we looked at was was facilities management, and what the system and the systems that were involved here were able to do was to recognize, okay, I read the contract, I understand what the con what, what this contract says. But I'm looking at the AP data, uh, and I see a lot of cleaning supplies, or a lot of looking at the, you know, some of the financials. I see a lot of cleaning supplies, and 
And so what I was able to do is say, well, you've got to look at this because if you're paying for cleaning supplies and the contract says you're not supposed to be cleaning supplies, then there's a gap, right? Quite frankly, again, if the business, the business who manages the facilities is not picking up on that, sourcing is never going to pick up on that, right? It's, you know, um, and so again, literally walking on the carpets that I've been cleaning with the cleaning supplies, uh, this, you know, it, you know, this came up, and, and there was over a million dollars in cleaning supplies that have been acquired, uh, you know, in, in the previous four years uh, under the terms of this agreement. And so you you begin to realize that, man, oh man, you know, it's it's just it just never ends, right? You know, companies, are, you know, companies are spending money on things that they don't need to spend money on, on such at such an, an amazing rate. It's, it's hard to keep up with. And, and and I've got a bunch of those those little kind of anecdotal type stories, you know, having to do with contingent labor. We're all dealing with huge contingent labor challenges. I can tell you that, you know, in a very short period of time, I was able to identify the fact that, you know, what we were paying in northern New Jersey. For or you know different levels of, of of contingent workers was either at below or at the top of of the market, and in, in many cases what I found we were paying you know in some cases twice the upper limit of what what was sh should be being paid in, in in this specific region of of New Jersey where I work. Again, as soon as you know the the the, the numbers don't lie, I sat down with those suppliers and, and immediately said, okay, you're, you hope you're ready for this, right? Because here's the data. And you can't argue with it, right? And and um, and and it didn't take very long, right? Once you can eliminate the, the knowledge gap, the information gap, which is what these systems allow you to do, you become much more efficient, much more effective at negotiating, uh, you know, with with your suppliers, and and quite frankly, building a repu a strong reputation with your clients. And once you build that strong rec rep reputation with your clients, they they call you for everything. And and I think ultimately that that for me is what kind of floats the boat, right? I, whenever some whenever I hear about a non-compliance thing, I take it really personally. I'm like, why why would you do that to me? Kind of, um, and so I don't get a lot of those calls anymore. So I'm, I I enjoy that very much. Yeah, I know, John. That was a that was a fantastic anecdote to to end our webinar. Hey, I thank both of you, John and Ita. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, your insights. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for dialing in. Um, there were a few questions that we could not take up, but uh, we'll be sure to follow up on those. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this recording will be up on our website uh, shortly. So thank you everyone for listening in and have a good rest of your day or evening, as the case might be. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.